To have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200 inch box? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. Sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Uh, I got a brand new podcast for you. So this week I have back on Rachel Attila. Uh, Rachel's a guide up in the Northwest Territories, and she's extremely knowledgeable and extremely successful. Um, she she guides sheep hunters and caribou hunters, and, and this past season she went on her own sheep hunt. And, and we tell the story of the adventure, and she just tells a great story. I'm not going to ruin it on the intro, but she tells this great story of who she shared the hunt with and, and just a true adventure hunt. Um, yeah, she's a great gal, and, and we just had this this honest, authentic talk. Um, it, it was it was really a great conversation. It was an early morning podcast, and we just got on and hit the record button. Um, you know, we made a, a few plans for what we were going to talk about, but but really, we just got talking and had a good back and forth, and and um, so, some good ones on perspective in this and and uh, mindset going into a hunt. She spent the the whole winter trapping in a cabin. She, had, We just talked about so many interesting things. I really enjoyed the conversation. I know you guys will too. Sponsor for today's show is Six Hour. Uh, Six Hour, you may know them for, from their quality pistols they build, but they're doing optics. I think they build the best rangefinder on the market. Um, I, I have one of their new rangefinders. I'm going to be using it this season. Um, you can get an app for your phone and you can tie it to your phone. So for rifle hunters, it'll do all the calculations for you and talk back and forth between your phone. Just does some amazing stuff for a bow hunter. Um, it, it's also an amazing rangefinder. It's got the angle compensating on it. So it'll tell you, you know, what the, the distance is you should shoot when you're shooting uphill or downhill. So you don't have to do a bunch of math to figure out where to aim. You know, you just hit the button and, and have that setting on there and you know exactly where to shoot um it's also extremely accurate it has last tor- target priority which i think is so important for shooting through grass to get that last target and it it's just a real accurate rangefinder. it shoots exactly where it's got a circle for um you know your reticle or for what you see you put it inside that circle you get a range um it's it's really consistent on light and dark targets um, consistent shooting through the grass, uh, just a great rangefinder. It's going to make me a better hunter. They also have optics, and and so I got their optics. Um, you guys, they are such high quality optics. They stand up to the to the most expensive brands out there, and and they're a third or half the cost. Um, just great binoculars. I got their 11 by 45s, their Zulu nines. Um, just, just great binoculars. I'm going to take them up to Alaska with me uh, using their spotting scope as well. And I'm just extremely impressed at the, the durability, the the quality, and, and just the, the quality of glass in these things. So uh, really cool optics. Make sure to check them out. Um, Sig Sauer, great company. Thanks for their support on the podcast. And over there at Eastman's, um, I did just see a promo, $20 for both magazines, Eastman's Hunting Journal, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal. Um, great, great staff articles, a how-to, how to be a, a better bow hunter, a better rifle hunter, and, and just different ways to think of things. And and uh, just a great team of staff writers. I always enjoy re- reading everybody else's article in there. Uh, I also enjoy our, our members section. Uh, or the MRS members research section. Uh, it's it just has uh, so much great data for hunting out of state and, and hunting different places and and statistics and and right now they have the deal twenty dollars for both magazines. It's an absolute steal. Make sure to check it out. And uh, I know we're just all getting excited for our hunts coming up and and uh, in the planning phase and and uh, just that anticipation is so much fun. Um, so shooting good, I'm just ready to challenge my skills and, and take it to the mountains and see where I'm at. So, um, I'm going to get out of here. I got this podcast all loaded up. Um, I'm sure I'll be hunting somewhere here in the near future. Like I say, headed to Nevada or right now I'm getting ready to, to head to Alaska, making sure I have enough of these loaded up and, and ready to go for you guys. So, uh, this is a great episode. So this is, uh, me and Rachel Attila Eastman's elevated. Here we go.
Okay, I'm live here with Rachel Attila. Um, we've had Rachel on the podcast before. Um, she She's such a, a hardcore hunter up there in Northwest Territory, so I'm really excited to have you back on the podcast. Thanks, Rachel, for being on. Thank you, Brian, for having me back. It's uh, your kind of celebration since I think we last talked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember um, last year when we talked, you were getting ready and excited for guide season, and then you also had a ram tag of your own, and you were going to surprise your dad um, because you guys grew up hunting together and take him on the hunt. How did that all shake out? Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, you know what? It all panned out. We had kind of a crazy – it evolved from inviting my dad to come on the hunt with me as a glorified packer, which was something he'd kind of joked about since I – started going back up north and guiding and wrangling and it was him and his buddies joke as they and they're like oh well she's living our dreams and when I got to kind of make that a reality for my dad and told him that I was getting to bring him and we got totally outfitted in some new kit I've never seen my dad speechless so he's a pretty witty man and to have him kind of come full circle and just stand there and he won't admit it but you know tears streaming out of his I mean just smiling um that was probably one of the most memorable moments I've got there standing with my dad. And uh, that was before we even got in the plane to go sheep hunting. <laughs> <laughs> before it even started. Before it even started. Uh, but no, it actually it worked out really well. We we ended up going up into the territories a few days early. I had uh, Adam Foss and a few of his close friends and a good friend of ours, uh, Ben Christian. Or, oh, man. Cut that piece out. Ben Christian. I got two different notes going on my mind. <laughs> Brad, right? Again. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't tell that. <laughs> <laughs> it's early in the morning. Yeah, we haven't had enough coffee yet, so you get a pass. Put the coffee in. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so exactly. We had um, Brad Christian from Sick of Gear come, and a good friend of mine, Adam Foss, and then we had Ben and Sean Pippen, and we actually had two gentlemen, uh, Shannon Vandeveer and J.K., who they have done international films for Red Bull, and so there's kind of. There was a lot of pressure riding on me because so I was like, oh, man, Adam was holding the guy's license and he was guiding me on this ram. He's been up in the territories numerous times on personal hunts or on projects. So all these men, you know, they kind of, they know what we're doing. And, well, there were six of us on the mountain. And we ended up getting in and it was hot. And There's that moment, Brian, when you're sitting there and you're like, holy smoke, pinch me this is actually happening. And when we descended in the base camp at Gannett River Outfitters this year, and we had a plane load of everyone in there and all of our gear. And I met the crew there. I was like, Oh my gosh, this is actually coming to fruition. This is, it's not just, you know, planning a head office. It's not just dad and I talking about it and joking around about not buying anything mountain house with beans in it because we were going to be sharing a tent. <laughs> like <laughs> all the little things that build up to that momentous occasion where it's like, all right, we're actually throwing our packs in the plane. Actually, we had the helicopter first. Uh, a good friend of mine, Megan Simpson of My Gypsy Skies, we were able to contract her to go and drop us off on location. So it, it worked out pretty cool. We got to involve a lot of my good friends and and, you know, young adventurous folks. And Megan and I went and did the scouting, and she dropped me off on probably one of the most northern parts of Harold's area that I had a little bit of a rematch on because I got skunked on. Uh, it would have been three or four years previous when I was a backpack guide. And there are rams there, but it is big country. So I was like, well, we'll see what we can find, and we'll go from there. And helicopters, a lot of people think that they're, you know, this easy and the machine you can just go and drop off everywhere no it's the rotors in the helicopter actually make the animals react a lot different and they're actually terrified of that the sound waves that come from it so people think oh you took a helicopter out there it must have been one day and done it's like no <laughs> those sheep run and caribou and moose they have no idea what to think so we got dropped off on the far end and when megan took off to go and get my dad and adam i had about an hour and a half two hours to sit there and just kind of appreciate the moment. And when Dad landed in that big old whirly bird, I've never seen him smile so big in my entire life. And it was just kind of one of those things where you put your hands up and the movie and then click, screenshot that. So it was it was fun. We had uh, tough hikes. We had long days. It was hot for the first part of that hunt. We had young rams where we were kind of parked on this one saddle. The two gentlemen, J.K. and Shannon, did a bunch of filming with us beforehand before the season even opened. And then opening morning, we actually had Brad come in. 
and fly. So we had to wait another 12 hours before we could hunt. So we were just kind of sitting ducks there, but it ended up working out, you know, we were all sitting there working on our can because it was so hot, nothing was moving. So the next day we decided to pack up our can and we got up over the crest of the ridge. And like, we can pick one direction or the other. And so we just started walking. I mean, the guys had red cameras, so I don't know if you've done anything with filming, but those batteries are like a brick. And we look like a bunch of camels making our way through the rocks and boulders as big as couches are bigger. Um, and we ended up on the second and third day, we came to a crest. We found one round that had kind of screwed around and, and a hasty decision where like, well, we should probably throw our packs down and have a closer look. It was definitely full curl, but I really wanted to shoot for that mature age mark. I wanted to hit for 10. Um, and <laughs> we got so close to this one round. I was like, I'm sorry, guys. Like, he's, he's nine. Like, I, we're only four or five days into this time. Like, he's a solid nine. We're hidden back. If you want to get a little bit of video footage, I'm not taking this ram. And, it, of course, it always happens on, you know, a young sheep or something like that or a young animal where you have the perfect ideal setup when you're having six cameras, well, six people on the mountain, let alone four cameramen, you know, someone acting as the guide, the shooter, and then dad acting, just trying to take it all in. It was like, holy smoke. So we had every night when we'd sit down to our mountain house and we'd be boiling snow, because that time of year there was no water up high, um, we'd have rock plans. Okay, if this is happens and this is how the stock goes, this is how everyone needs to be in position. And at the end of the day, you know, it's, you're still sheep hunting and dad was just sitting there just grinning the entire time. And I think, the whole point of that hunt was just getting to spend time together. And each one of the people that had been on that hunt had had those kind of special moments with their father. And they really appreciated what it was like to be on that hunt and share that with us. So it, it didn't take away from kind of the uniqueness of me and my dad being able to go and do the sheep hunt. And between death marches when we'd seen rams and setting up camps and then having to hike down with water and empty our packs and leave some guys up high so we could go down and save our legs and uh, find snow and find little bits of water. You know, it was something that we had to factor into our day because when you're up at over, you know, 5,500 to 6,000 feet, water is not exactly one of those commodities that you can go at 7-Eleven and just get a bottle of Aquafina. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, right? It's one of those things that's like, oh, yeah, it's summer. That's what happens when everything dries up. But... Uh, as as fate would have it, we ended up setting up camp, and lo and behold, we had three little white dots the next ridge over, which in theory was only about just over fourteen or 1,500 yards we'd figured from one location on our ridge. We watched them for quite a bit, but it was late in the day, and we had this haze come in, and there was a little bit of smoke, and we seen these rams bed down, and we're like, okay, perfect, well, we'll get up early when the light is good, and we don't have any kind of you know, apparitions wasn't through our scopes. <clears throat> we'll see there's one ram in particular in there that looks pretty good. And we thought we could see that he was broomed on one side. Well, as we were sitting there that next morning, we got up. We just packed up camp. It's like, okay, let's sit and watch these rams. If they feed towards us, we'll figure out how we're going to make our play. If they feed over, well, <laughs> pack up our stuff, boys, because we're going to have a long hike up this ridge all the way around the bowl, and then we got to find them when we get to the other side, because based on our topo, it kind of wide, so they could have been anywhere. Well, we're sitting there, and I remember, remember my dad going, hey, I think I see something coming at them. What do you mean? He goes, I think it's a bear. He goes, oh, no. He goes, it's running way different. We put up the spotting scope, and we had a freaking wolverine come mock chicken in on our rams. <sighs> Trying to take it all in. <laughs> exactly. That was our expression. There's, a, there's no words. All of our chins dropped. We had optics flying up. We were trying to locate it. This little bugger had come up, circled around, caught wind, dropped in below them, and started chasing the sheep. And the sheep, from where we were sitting, went right back up and right back down over the other side of the ridge. <laughs> After the last sheep disappeared and that wolverine hot on its track, I think we all just sat there for a second and were like, well... The sheep are either going to be on the next ridge, hanging out in a bluff, escaping the wolverine, or they're on their way through to Arctic Red to the Yukon border. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, they're the best sheep we've seen so far. Let's take a vote. 
So that was about at seven or so in the morning, Brian, and we packed up camp. And we're like, well, we can't we can't rush. We don't want to twist an ankle, but we'll make haste. So we hiked with our loads all the way up the mountain, all the way around the basin. While we were there, we found a, a moose shed, I guess a winter kill, mm-hmm. antlers and everything intact, spinal cord on the top of the freaking mountain, miles from any swamp. So we figured that was something that the wolves probably ran up high and he had to die from exhaustion or was actually taken up on a snow ridge and then bleached out for forever. We made our way around and we skirted and we were dropping and looking and we couldn't find any sheep anywhere else. It was the heat of the day. So our goal had been that we would try and traverse up to the t- very tippy top of this point. But based on what my Garmin had said, we would have the viewpoint of the two ridges. So it was about six or seven o'clock at night, a good 10 hour, 12 hour hike to get all the way around. It looked like it should have taken us only half the time, but with the terrain and the heat, it just freaking was brutal. We drop over the other side and the boys had just kind of hung back on the top of the rocks and caught the breath. And I snuck over and I kid you not, about a thousand yards below me, the sheep stood up and their button heads and they were eating willows. I didn't know whether to pinch myself or tell my dad to come look. I was like, surely I must have, I need to drink some more water, get some electrolytes in me. Like, there's no way. Well, lo and behold, the rams must have just deeped them out in a little bit of a bluff that were there. A couple of the, two of the younger ones were bedded down, and there was another ram that had come in. And this one wasn't quite as big as the broom ram, and they were kind of sorting out their dominance in the willow brushes. So we sat and we watched and we waited. And none of them were giving us a good play where I was sitting on the very tip of this mountain. We couldn't sneak down to the left and we couldn't sneak down to the right. They literally, we'd have to wait until they were going to give us their play on which way they were going to move. And with the 24 hours of daylight, there's like two hours that are dusty that technically you can't hunt in. So like, well, we're just going to have to wait this one out. And without setting up tents that night, we got some really cool video footage of us literally sleeping in our sleeping bag. We threw our phones out. I had my binoculars in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other, and we slept on the top of the world that night. We had the bugs hovering in unison above us just as, like, it started to go into death, and we just, it was one of those moments where it's so quiet and it's so still. Not a plane, not anything, and it just was magical. And that next morning... Um, just as we started having a little bit of breakfast and we were taking turns watching the sheep, all of a sudden, as we got camp packed up, the one big ram, the one that was broom that we needed a closer look at, because at this point I hadn't been able to age him. You're looking down and he's going through the willows and we're way too far away. And they'd fed out to like 1,500 yards or more. It was like, there's no, we're not going to make a play until we know, but we need to, this is a ram that we need to actually go after and have a closer look at. And within two seconds, that ram got up, took a leak, stretched his legs, and started walking. And he was walking down to the right arm, and it's like, okay, here we go, people. So we loaded up our bags, we strapped on our boots, and we took off down the left-hand side as fast as we could, down to the house-sized boulder rock. And where the ram was headed, it had looked like we had found him the same night, because there was a nice little grass band on the other side. So we, watching our wind, stayed down on the right arm, and there was a few little pinnacles towards the end. We had dropped our packs back. We had the most meager gear. We didn't, you know, in hindsight, you know, as a guide, I'm like, oh, I wish I had been in rain gear. It was a bluebird day, and it was early in the morning, so I was like, we'll chance it. We literally got there, got set up on the second to last pinnacle, almost at the end of this arm on the ridge. Seen the green patch. I was like, it's going to be 150 to 200 yard shot. Everyone was set up behind me. Dad was sitting right there. Dad was starting to get a little bit shaky. I was getting a little bit shaky and remembering breathe. And I was like doing the whole guide talk going through my head. So I looked through the scope. Adam was behind me. He was watching. I remember opening up the scope and I was looking. And I, you know, made sure there's nothing in the chamber. I did a dry fire. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm golden. It's going to be good. We're, you know, I was chit chatting with a bunch of little squirrels, a bunch of everything. And all of a sudden, that kind of corner of my eye around this last bit of pinnacle. I see a horn. What in the frig? And this horn, is, it's looking around. This horn, I kid you not, is 25 yards from me, Brian. Oh. 
So I'm trying at 25 yards when you're literally laying out on a rock and everyone's set up behind you at higher elevations. And so they're totally exposed because this is not the play that we we're counting on. I'm trying to like make my hand look frantic and like trying to make the motion. But there's a sheep coming and it's like right here. Everyone quiets down. There's almost that stillness. And all of a sudden the sheep sticks his nose out to one side of the pinnacle and he's on the bottom end of it. Kind of stands there for a second. I'm like, Come on, you probably walk into the grass. Walk into the grass. And he disappears. And it's like, okay, now what? Well, I'll be damned if that thing doesn't come back around up to the left side of the pinnacle. And he's standing at 18 yards looking at me and my dad. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see just white in my dad's eye. Just, just like, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> We're just sitting there having a Mexican standoff with this sheep, pardon me. And I slowly bring my gun over and we were waiting, trying to make sure that I had enough time to let everyone else know that, you know, like, this is a ram, we're going to age him. How do you communicate that when you're under 18 yards? So through my spotting scope, I aged him, Adam aged him. He gave me the tap for yes is okay, but one tap was he's good. Wait for two or three taps because we have to make sure that everyone's on cue for the video. Well, I didn't get the three taps and it's like... <laughs> You're sitting there in your mind, and that's when time slows down, and you're just like your blood is pulsing, your fingers are throbbing, and you're like, "What am I doing? Like this ram is gonna bugger away. We're at 18 yards. The footage is gonna be amazing." And this ram starts getting impatient because he can sense something isn't quite right. But we're all in the subalpine. We literally must have looked like a bunch of moss that just was so out of place on this rock. And he goes to leave, and at some point he turns around. And he jumps up halfway on this pinnacle and he's stomping his foot and he's grunting. And I'm waiting for that tap and I start whispering to Adam. I'm like, are we good? <laughs> like, are we real good? Because he's going to leave. Adam, are we good? <laughs> and that moment where you're like, it's not going to happen. He jumps up onto the very top of the pinnacle and at 22 yards, I get the three finger tap. And I remember watching through my scope that animal going down. I remember unloading. I remember being my rifle safe. And then I remember just shaking and holding my dad. And I don't, I, I, I held it together until I was able to pull the trigger. And then as I pulled the trigger, like <laughs> I'm going to get emotional here, all the guides that have, I I couldn't, all the sheep I've killed with hunters, you know, the hunters that we've stayed friends, the people that I've met throughout the way, you know, their first sheep, their 20th sheep, like, I feel like all those sheep just passed before my eyes as I pulled the trigger on my very own ram, and it just it was super surreal, and I couldn't talk. I, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and there was a lot of emotion. There were tears. There was, I think there were words at some point. Um, and, uh, yeah, he one shot, and he came right off, and <laughs> it was the quickest retrieval we've ever had <laughs> to walk 10 paces down to where he fell off the pinnacle. <laughs> But no, I don't think I've ever had quite a hunting experience that meant so much and came full circle and so close and so in, intimate almost. And with so many people, it was just, it was crazy, Brian. Absolutely crazy. Oh, how intense. Um, <laughs> boy, you got, you got the full experience. Um, how cool, Rachel. Like, um, yeah, everything from start to finish, you touched on so many good points and I can almost, as you're telling that story, put myself there. But, um, yeah, that, that anticipation before a hunt where you're really looking forward to it and you're doing all the planning and, and getting everything together and where you're going to go and where you're going to track and, and you're right, it's almost surreal once you you finally know you're going. It's the day you're going to go hunting. And, and then being able to share that experience and anticipation you know, with your dad and with, with a great group of friends. And I can't believe mm -hmm. you had a red camera on there. <laughs> that is wild. Well, like um, for the one. photo guys, it's that's the three. ultimate. <laughs> no kidding, we, huh? Oh, man. Yeah, they're, they're doing a pretty cool film that I think should be coming out later this year. Um, for Sika, it was pretty under wraps when we were doing it, but we can kind of start talking about it now. But yeah, we have a whole new appreciation. I at least have a whole new appreciation for. I used to film for Jim Shockey, and the batteries were nowhere near that size. He had to carry a lot of them, but I never did a sheep hunt with them. So my appreciation for videographers, <laughs> man alive, 
we we were trying to share the load, but as we were coming down, Dad and I ended up taking the brunt of the sheep, obviously, and uh, there was no way anyone else was packing my horns off the mountain. And it, it was so hot, Brian, that we literally, we had to wait. We found a cool pit of shade right beside where we had taken the ram. Uh, we got our photos. We butchered up the sheep and laid it on rocks in the shade just so that the meat wouldn't spoil and it kind of got a nice little crust on it. Um, because, for, like, for filming, too, they wanted to be able to get, you know, the nice shot as we walked down. And for personal, you know, survivalness, it was so hot that day that it's like there's no – we're going to kill ourselves trying to walk off this mountain in the dead of the heat. It must have been pushing 30 degrees Celsius. So that walk off the mountain that night and then cook in tenderloins, we had some flat rock food found and you make like a little hibachi grill. And Adam Voss actually, you know, guide tip of the year, they have little olive oil packets you can get in the States. I usually carry like a little vial, but God bless America, you guys have everything in condiments in a little <laughs> like one time <laughs> use packet. And so we brought olive oil and a little bit of salt and pepper and those tenderloins over the fire that night once we set up down at our new camp and had water we were living like kings it was that was like the end of a pinnacle adventure and like brad christian i don't think he'd ever been up that neck of the woods neither and i don't know it's you know it's one of those things when you talk about it so much and you see your friends do it and until you go with your friends and you see what they do and you walk in their shoes and on the mountains that they traverse it's it's like you get to know that person a little bit more. And I think it was really neat to share the mountain with all those guys. Cause you just, you grow an appreciation for everyone else's skill and, and you know, their time, like it was, it was a brutal grueling hunt packing around a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, that, you know, you talk about that heat and so 30 degrees Celsius, that's like pushing 90 degrees Fahrenheit for, for all our listeners here in the States, but that is hot. And it's wild, the extra exertion that that puts on you. And then how much water you go through. You talked about uh, your water and up on these, these high country hunts. I have the same thing with, with mule deers, these animals. I'm sure the dolls are kind of like the mule deer where they get a lot of their moisture content from their feed or from the dew of the grass, or they can just travel so much country. They've got some, some seeps or or some springs but boy to have to boil all your water um it's amazing how much snow you have to boil to get a drink of water <laughs> yes and how dirty snow really is <laughs> it's so dirty you get the cleanest stuff but it's always so dirty when you drink it and it it doesn't have a good mm-hmm. taste to it either does it no you know this whole nostalgia about having a snow cone at the top of the mountain it's like <laughs> maybe not <laughs> But it, it, that's a very real thing. And, like, you know, the first part of the season, if you had rain showers, there are – it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. But if you know where certain little water spots are, you know, it's a safe haven that you go to and you, like, you drink your fill and then you load up your water bottle and it's, you know, having little sips. You can't just stand there and guzzle a whole water back because, you know, it takes 500-plus meals for a mountain house meal or a backcountry meal. So you have to ration your water out throughout the day. And when you're hiking, you know, 30, you know, 90 degrees doesn't sound probably too hot to everyone who lives in the deep south, like Texas, where you see temperatures of like 110s. But when you're carrying a pack that's between, you know, on the lighter days, about 45 upwards to like 70 pounds or more, like you're right, that strain, that physical strain, it's not like you're walking on a flat terrain either. You're pushing yourself up over rocks, you're descending down, you're walking on uneven ground, you know, your elevation changes so rapidly that it's it's a different kind of ball game for sure. Yeah, that's where electrolytes, they're king in the back country. We started joking there's um those stinger jujibs, I don't know if you have them with a little bee on them. My dad jokingly said he will hike for jujubes and they had brought up a bunch of them and they're a great light tasty little um calorie snack with electrolytes in them that kind of they jokingly that kept us going the whole hunt so oh that's wild yeah the um the exertion level too like you say hiking around in that above tree line that high country alpine environment i mean it it's mountaineering but it it's Mm -hmm. mountaineering and you have to you don't just have to get to the top and then climb back down like you have to get to the top of the one and then the next one and live up there and survive up there to be able to give your chance at at a at a sheep or a mule deer whatever the case is um but Mm -hmm. but that trekking around 
it's um you know you also talked about taking in the experience and enjoying it like you're working so hard and sweating so much and you're trying to 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 find these rams and you're so immersed in the challenge that sometimes you're right like that quietness you talked about sometimes you just got to sit down and, and take it all in and take an hour and it's just like I haven't heard this quiet uh, for for years since I was back here the last time, but that quiet when it settles in and you just realize, like, I am on this hunt. Like, I, I need to enjoy this journey and enjoy this process and enjoy the people I'm around. But, yeah, that that's just amazing. That's really wild. Oh, thank you. No, and I think that's, you know, the, there's that famous saying from Jack O'Connor, sheep hunters are romantic. Um, and I think anyone who spends any kind of great deal of time in the backcountry, there's there's almost like a reset button you hit. And I know there is for me. Like when I go north, I do my greatest thinking. I do my greatest, you know, hypothetical life planning or not so much planning, but just appreciating what I have when I come home. Like a flushing toilet and a shower every morning is a God's gift after, you know, you have <laughs> like a little toilet paper bath or whatever you call them. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that, is so intoxicating about the whole process is that you have that reset at the end of the day you were stripped of everything technology you might have a garmin you might have a new mystery ranch pack you know you might have the latest and greatest gear but at the end of the day that gear is only as good as you are it's only as good as you know how to traverse it's only as good as you know how to survive or when to read the weather or what to wear what to pack like and i think that is almost the empowering side of those kind of extreme hunts is that you know you can go and do it. And I think that's one big thing that for people that are getting into mountain hunts, it's, it's a challenge. And until you get there and you experience it and you either made a few mistakes or had a few victories, it's that personal self-confidence. It's like, oh, man, I actually, I went and did that. You know, I can't just call for help and have someone come pick me up in a pickup truck, you know, 20 feet down the road. Like, we're here. We're committed. If it rains and the weather can't come and nothing is going on and the helicopter can't come and the super cub can't come, like you got to make sure that you're going to be okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's so empowering. And um, I, I liked, you know, how, how you said, um, you know, the shower never felt so good. When you're on a backcountry hunt, <laughs> it's, um, you're, you're, at, you're pushing yourself to your limits mentally and physically to, to keep going and to keep charging and to try to get it done. But after it's all said and done and you get back in town and you have that first cheeseburger and you get that shower and, <laughs> and uh, you have a house with running water, all of a sudden you're not melting and eating dirty snow, you know, you, it makes you appreciate your life. And I know, you know, that's for me too, that reset button is I come back and I appreciate my job more. I appreciate what I have, my house, and I appreciate mm -hmm. my family, my wife and my kids and spending time with them. Um, and that, that reset button it you can't make yourself do it just when you're in the grind of of work and life or at least it's more difficult but when you're in the mountains and you get to enjoy what you really love to do it, it gives you an appreciation for all that and it seems like you come back and you charge life better you you charge at your job to do the best job you can you you charge at your family to to make sure you're spending that quality time where during the year you get a little complacent on that stuff but that that reset button those um us as humans, we're just meant to be challenged, and, and we found, you know, we're lucky where we have this passion of this backcountry hunting that we love to do, and, and when you spend time doing it, yeah, it, it resets your soul, it resets your life, and you you come back and you work harder at things and appreciate things more, so I'm right with you, I, I um, those those mountain hunts just mean the world to me, and and that's why you you, you train all year and you you get ready for those things, and then when you're on them, you you give it your absolute all. So in the off season, when you look back on it, whether you were successful or whether you failed, you know you gave it everything you had in there. Yeah, and you know, I the as I'm stumbling through my words here, it was actually. A lot of it, too, is very metaphoric, you know, when you're climbing a mountain and climbing a mountain through life. And what a lot of people don't know and they will know now is, you know, people in their personal life have ups and downs. And the night before I flew in with my dad, I had found out that I had been in a very toxic relationship. So, you know, all the girls who are listening or everything like that or the guys who have been there, like, you know, there's that whole other side of going to the mountains it's also hard on a person when you talk about the mental and the physical side is leaving that family that you love or leaving relationships because 
you have this love affair with the mountains, but I had found out that I had been in a very bad relationship and my ex-boyfriend had been cheating on me. And so imagine going there and like having not good settle at home and then going to the mountains and having a full season to decompress. And when you're climbing that mountain, you're trying to put aside everything that's going on at home and then going back, you know, into something that you love and climbing that mountain means something that much more because, you know, we've all been there. You know, it, it's not something that people like to talk about, but it's the dirty side of life where, you know, people are unfaithful or something happens and you have to cowboy up and move on, right? You know, we get, we lose our jobs and you got to put a smile on your face and you got to go home and say, well, I'll try and find another one tomorrow. Like, I think for me this season, it made me come at things a little bit differently because I had been just kind of taken aside with everything that had happened in my life and, and what existed was right then and now. And over like the thought process of literally climbing that mountain and having like a million things running through my mind, you know, and having my dad there and, you know, the whole emotional aspect of it we had really big talks on the mountain about life and what's important. And I know like you and I were talking, Brian, before we jumped on the call, like there's almost this vibe too, where people, we get caught up with the Joneses and you're, you're trying to do too much and you're trying to, you know, figure out where you need to be. And, you know, do I do this or do I have to have this in my career to be successful? And at the end of the day, when we're on that hunt and then throughout the rest of my season, having that humbling experience of not having everything how I thought it should be, it kind of taught me to go, you know what, what's important in my life? What am I actually working towards? Is it because I want to own an outfit that I think I need to do a podcast that I think I need to do this? Or is that a pressure I'm putting on myself, you know, just, just trying to be relevant in the industry. And it's like, no, I, I really do enjoy this. And I was doing it a long time ago. And I know you and I are talking about this. It's like, how do you find that balance in life? And the, I think the secret is you just keep going, just like that hunt. You know, I, you can't change things that happen to your life. You know, you have all of these different impressions from how people react or what people do to you and, and how you digest them. But at the end of the day, you just keep going and you figure out what's important to you and you reset. Oh, that's so horrible that you had to deal with that right before <laughs> your hunt like that. <laughs> that is nuts, Rachel. I bet, um, you know, when you go on a mountain hunt like that, you know, all you really have is time to think, too, in, inside <laughs> your own head. Like, I, that would be a nightmare, but it, it ended up being the best thing for you where you were able to do some deep thinking and figure out what was important to you. And so, you know, you took a negative and turned it into a positive. But um, what a what a horrible situation for your dream hunt, and then you have to go inside your own head and and think about that and and rethink about it and go through it and through it because there's no hiding from your thoughts up there. You know they're no. they're fresh and present, but you were able to get through it. And then uh, I think that's um so great what you said, like just figuring out what's important to you. Like in life, we get one chance, and and the one thing mm -hmm. you know the secret of life, or at least for me, is is personal happiness. You know how how can I be happy in it? You know, it, it, the life isn't always perfect. We all have trials and tribulations and oh, yeah. we all have bad things happen to us, you know, some to other degrees and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, I, you know, I had a case of that too, I, where I was doing the podcast and, you know, all of a sudden things were just going wrong for me. I had, I had messed up this, this went wrong in my life, you know, you extra bill for this or, or money stress mm -hmm. or whatever the case is, but it just felt like it was stacking up on me and you just got to sit back and you go, you know, I all I can do is is make a decision how I'm going to move forward. You know, how can exactly. I how can I handle this? Because sitting here worrying about it isn't going to solve my problem. You know, what's my next step to getting out of this? What what moves can I make? A and then you focus on those moves and executing those moves to get through those tough times. But um, happiness in life, I think, is everything. And and we all have to make money. And and uh, you know, we we all have. You know responsibilities that we need to take care of, but uh, I think I think we need to remember that more and more as just what makes me happy. And sometimes on these grueling hunts, especially when you got something in your head like that, 
or if you have problems in your life and you're out there hunting, sometimes you're you're not enjoying it and you're thinking, oh, I should be home and I should be doing this, or you know, I I should I should be making a post about this or a, a something mm-hmm. about this. But really, you need to be enjoying life to the fullest, and and, and I think that perspective that you get from that backcountry, or I think figuring that out and focusing on your personal happiness is so important. It is, and you know what it. When you're at your lowest, you also can find your highest. And, I, you know, it it wasn't something I was looking for sympathy with, but I feel like every now and then people need to have a real dose of reality. It's not all, you know, sugar cookies and kittens. Like, <laughs> stuff happens, right? And I think, you know, leaving that summer with having just that new perspective of, you know, being grateful for grateful for the trials and grateful for, you know, the journey, so to speak. Um, it kind of, it gave me kind of a different reset switch when I left the mountains that year. And, you know, we're, I think that that's something that people need to be more real about. Um, I've had a lot of interest, people saying, oh, you had the podcast, you had this, you had this going. It's like, I did. And then I went and I spent a month up north. I packed up my life, um, after the guiding season and you know you talk about moving on and when you're homeless and you got two horses and a storage locker and a horse trailer and a truck I was like well you know I here I am and I uh I ended up going all the way up to northern British Columbia and hunting a grizzly tag um which ended up working out well down the road but they needed someone to go and um house at their hunting lodge so I was like if you don't mind me hauling my two horses all the way from down south I'll have a month here while you guys are away. And, and, you know, it's just that attitude of perfect. Well, I got to go and live at a hunting lodge in probably some of the prettiest country known to man with, you know, sheep and goats and bears and everything out the back door. And in this tiny little community with no cell phone service and no Wi-Fi. So when you talk about resetting and when you see people using like Garmin in as a like real thing, that's seriously a real thing where we live. And, you know, from there you had, you end up figuring things out and kind of extending that thinking pattern into the fall and figuring out what was going to be important to me. And I ended up, as fate would have it, meeting someone absolutely wonderful that was half as crazy as I was. And we went trapping this winter. And I tell you what, <laughs> that was, I thought I had been on the snow machine. No, there is no, there is nothing like learning how to go. And I wasn't even breaking trail. Um, I was following along, but you know, you talk about like new experiences in life and just grabbing life by the horns and going with it. Um, I, I made some pretty big rookie moves on a little tundra snow machine where if you fart one direction, it's going the next, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you talk about being in the back country and I was broadening my horizons this winter, I had never really gone trapping ever. I, I appreciated it. I can understand why I did it, why people did it for predator control. But the art of going out there and like, you know, watching uh, someone set snares or, or understanding the thought process of how you set traps or figuring out where wolves are going to run and and then they're making a game plan like it was a whole new world to me that was very welcome and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So oh, that... it, you know, it just it comes full circle, right? Everything happens for a reason, and like you say, it, it's going with it and it's experiencing it and. The best part was I got to spend more time in the backcountry this winter, out of cell phone service, out of Wi-Fi. What an amazing winter, yeah, uh, an amazing journey. It seems like uh, even though bad things can happen and it may seem like uh, everything's crashing down upon you, like – um, time heals everything and it always gets mm. better. And now, you know, you're better off and happier than you ever were before, it sounds like. And and then it's so important to spend time away from that dang cell phone or away from connected to that. You know, for me, I, I'm really good about turning that thing off and not looking at it and not checking at it. Like I need a break from that thing. And so mm-hmm. for me, getting away from it is extremely important. And it's a it's a new challenge in today's day and age. And, you know, you used to be, you know, guys would leave their cell phones or wouldn't turn them on where they're hunting. And, and I see nowadays guys are on their phones all the time while they're hunting. You know, I just, um, I I have a hard time doing that. Like I have to disconnect, but, um, what a great winter to disconnect and, 
and and really tap into who you really are and what makes you happy you know being away from all all of the the social media being away from the podcast and away from society just focused on on you and your own life um what mm-hmm. that's just amazing and all of those snow machines too um <laughs> it's it's not like you just hop on those things and ride anywhere you want to go like those no. things take muscles that you don't even know you had like you have to <laughs> lean on those things and and and, and control them and feel them they have to be almost an extension of your body and when you're new on those things like like sounds like you were a little new even though you had experience and i'm fairly new as well you know i've been on a handful of them but you got to keep on that gas like crazy and and try to find control of that thing and then when you're a bad snowmobiler like me i'm stuck all the time and once you get stuck (laughs) then you've just signed yourself up for a half an hour or more of work of trying to dig that thing out to get going again and you think okay i'm never letting off that throttle again but i bet that was a learning experience oh man let me tell you that's one thing you know what i was very fortunate i had a really good teacher and um david he he's like well you're gonna learn and i can't be there the whole whole time but growing up as a horseback rider i mean you know when you you start talking about stock and balance and whether you're hiking on the mountains you know you have like your core strength that helps you carry a pack and when you're horseback riding that Horse strength transfers over when you're carrying a heavy backpack off the mountain and jumping on your horse and then riding back to camp. Well, to me, I'm like, okay, well, I'm looking at the snow machine and I'm sizing it up and going, okay, well, it's got two pegs. I got two legs. So maybe I should keep both my feet on, you know, either side. And, you know, I thought by leaning, it was like leaning with my butt or leaning with my leg. And I kid you not, Brian, we literally unloaded the tundra and David got it off the track. I went to go over my first berm sideways right in the powder and he's like well <laughs> how are you gonna figure this one out and, you know i'm a little bit stubborn on most days and i'm like okay well how and he's like well think about it and i you know i did pretty good and we were going through powder because we had had one of the um the plow outs cut out and so we had to traverse through this brand new fresh powder that was two or three feet deep and i'll never forget the feeling on those regular tracks where you literally feel like you're riding an ocean wave trying to balance out. And I was going, oh, my gosh, I'm getting wore out, and I'm about 10 minutes in, and we've got a whole track to go to the cabin to set a bunch of traps today. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, it's it's a whole other beast. But, you know, you open yourself up to that interpretation of, okay, well, I'm going to try this. I'm probably not going to be very good at it. But, you, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that if you don't try, you don't go. So... And it, it's kind of neat, you know, from there being able to expand. Um, he did really well this year, trap one section. And for everyone out there, he pretty much got, I think it was like seven or eight wolves, I think he got in that one area. And I ended up skinning them all. And I have a whole new appreciation for skinning um, wolves that, you know, you keep frozen and then you saw out systematically. Anyone is going to do it, Bed Bath & Beyond Peppermint Candle. Um, I had three of them lit up in the shop and a lot of, no- <laughs> a lot of toilet paper to shove up my nose. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that it's interesting to, like, look at the wolves when you're skinning them out. And he caught one white one. She's a big old female. And, you know, Hollywood and Disney paint this picture of wolves in a loving, caring, nurturing pack. Well, for the most part, I'm sure they are in their own realm. But you can tell this she-wolf on the last you know, however many weeks or months of her life, she had been beat to heck. You know, chew marks and bite marks all the way up her spine, all the way down the backs of her legs, where she was either run off of a pack or she had run into a new pack. And as I was fleshing her out, it was it was brutal to see the wounds that they inflict on each other. And, you know, like, they'll kill each other as well. So from an understanding on the predator management side, you know, you, you see it, you hear it, but then when you're actually out doing it, it's like that tertiary level of appreciation for why this exists and um it'll, it'll be exciting i think he's going to be trapping three lines this winter and where we're based out of we're just going to make a habit of going up every two weeks once th- once things are set because it's a kind of a fortnight thing that you do have to check through your snares if you're doing leg holds um it's every 72 hours and you know it, there's there's this very old dying art as a practice of doing trapping and doing it right yeah that's um what a great learning experience and and um 
you know, humans are built like a taking yourself out of a out of your comfort level is a good thing. And I need to remember that, too. I get so comfortable in hunting and bow hunting. And I, you know, I paid my dues and I, you know, I have the knowledge and not that I'm the, the best out there, but I know what I'm doing and have confidence in my skills to go to any different habitat or or place and, and to, to try to figure it out and, and immerse myself in the hunt. But taking yourself out of that comfort level is a good thing. Like. I just got mm-hmm. back from Hawaii and like you doing spear diving is way outside my comfort level. And those Hawaiians oh, have been wow. doing it since they were babies. But for me to, you know, and I've got good lungs, I run all the time. I'm at sea level. <laughs> I can hold my breath, but I get out, out there and, uh, you know, I, I'm lost. I don't know. You know, I'm definitely outside my comfort level. I'm looking around and I think Jaws is coming around every corner, you know, and then I, I've got a, like, there's monsters out there in the oceans and I, I've been around grizzly bears and I'm comfortable, but I haven't been around tiger sharks or white sharks like in that, you know, it's almost like a inside my own head. And those guys are so comfortable and have done it so much. It doesn't even bother them. But but not mm-hmm. only that, but just the uh, the skills of trying to breathe through a straw and get your air as you're floating around and waves crashing over you. And, and then you've got to blow out your snorkel. You're breathing seawater. I drank more seawater than I think a man's supposed to. <laughs> and, and then, you know, being able to hold your breath and dive 15 feet under and sneak around those rocks to, to spear dive fish like that's outside my comfort level. And I, I just think the more that we can do that, um, the, the better off and, and you're growing as a person. So just like you and your trap line and the snowmobiles and, and, and things that you aren't familiar with, but you take on this new task and this new challenge. And, and uh, I think you, when you do figure it out or get to a level of proficiency, it feels really good. It was like when I when I started at this, I, I didn't know anything. And now, mm-hmm. you know, I've been able to do it all winter long. I've been able to skin these wolves and trap these wolves and in the trap line and get back on my snowmobile. I, I just think that's so neat. And I think it's so pertinent to our journey in life. Exactly. It's another life skill. And I think that's one thing at the end of it, you know, you can't take away social media likes, you can't take away all of these things that we put such an importance on. But what you can take away from living a full life is the things that you've tried, the things you were successful at, the things you failed at, the things you learned from, and the things that genuinely give you fulfillment and a sense of enjoying your life. Because Every day, you know, we go through hardships, whether it's family members passing or becoming ill or having hardships at home. You know, it's it's one of those things that you're you're out of control of, but you can control how you react. And I think that, you know, not like learning from that, it's kind of it's a very enlightening and freeing experience when you realize it's like, well, I could do this today, but I really enjoy doing this. And do I need to tell everyone I'm doing it? No. If I want to share about it, that's my own personal journey, right? And and it's not to take away and say that, you know, social media is a bad thing, but I think it's how we use it. And I would challenge everyone that's listening to kind of dig deep and realize, okay, do I am I doing this for my own personal gain or am I doing this for pure enjoyment? And I don't know, I think that would be my greatest wish for people is to have that that time away from everything to really appreciate their own journey. And maybe that's super spiritual and I sound like a total granola country, but maybe I've just been spending too much time above alpine sheep hunting. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's kind of fun. So I think, Brian, like, you know, in full circle, like the podcast I'm going to keep doing, um, it'll be in the fall. We're set to trail in any day now, um, headed to the mountains for another guiding season. I'm going to actually stay home in BC and guide down here this year. And uh, when I get out in the fall and I've got cell phone service, Wi-Fi, and a home to come home to, like I feel like I'm still with, I'm sitting here drinking coffee out of my own mug that's been in storage for 10 years, which also, I will note, has a bison on it, and it's handcrafted, and it got me good luck. I drew a bison tag with our group friend this year. So, sorry for all of you guys in BC that drew LEHs, or they didn't. (laughs) <laughs> but this girl's going bison hunting and I'm going to owe that to drinking coffee out of my own bison mug. 
<laughs> oh, good for you. Yeah, congratulations on the tag. That'll be a really neat Thank you very much. Hunt. Yeah, and so much great meat, too. Um, but, yeah, congratulations. Oh, yeah. So you talk about a home. You've been living on the road for um, like 10 years, I think you were telling me. And so you have your own house now and a home base, and you have uh, cell phone coverage and Wi-Fi. Well, You're really stepping you into the – Yeah, right? You're really stepping into the 21st century. Yeah, you know, there's, there's hope for us yet. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I think that's kind of one of the cool things about this season is that, you know, I, we joke about it, but um, the gentleman I'm seeing, David, he, he was more of a squirrel than I was, so our nicknames are Squirrel and Squirrelette, but we literally would live, He was he's from out east originally, and he's traveled back and forth and guided the last 10 or 12 years up um, in the north country as well. How we haven't crossed paths, you know, that's one of the great plans of the universe, but... Um, is having bags in the back of my truck. I would literally have four seasons worth of stuff in my vehicle at any one time with, you know, my 4570 to go to the mountains. My bow would be in the back in case I got extra time at the end of a hunt to go and do something for myself. You know, I'd have my saddle, all my tack. I was like a roving woman of all master of traits just in case I needed to be somewhere or do something. And then I would go back to my storage locker from the fall season, I would change out everything into like my winter girl clothes and keep one uh, one back of like winter hunting clothes. I'd look at all my stuff. I'd literally sit there in my storage locker, look at all my stuff and go, okay, one day you'll be set up. Today's not the day. <laughs> and then I'd close it and I'd go back on the highway. And it's so different now to actually have a home to come home to where I can see my horses out my kitchen window and, and everything's right here and I have a closet. I have a closet with hangers from all my hunting gear. And it's like, wow, is this how the other half lives? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, it comes back to that whole where you put your energy and where you put your emphasis. And now that I've been able to decompress, you know, the highway side, man, I should have taken out, uh, I don't know, checks or something as far as like how many miles I would put on in a season and in a year. And how many gas stations? I should have had frequent flyer miles. But now actually having a home to come home to and being able to plan trips from here and, and having like a sense of home and region. Oh, it's kind of cool. Not having to go between places or travel across the country and, and the money and the time expended is kind of nice to just being able to just sit at home. Oh, yeah. I I, I love my house as well. Like I love going on these adventures and I, I love, you know, being able to travel and see these new things. And I love being outside too. Every free day I get, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, well, I've got to work too, but I'm fly fishing or I'm hunting or I'm hiking. I'm, you know, I, I run to all the tops, all these peaks around here in the summertime, single track trail running. So I love to be busy like that, but you know, in the evening or when things are winding down, you know, there's no place I'd rather be than my home. I love my home. You know, I I built it, you know, all with my two hands and I, I did all the labor for free on my entire house, you know, and so there's That's a sense awesome. of pride and created this, you know, it, I bettered my life and my, my family's life. So I love being here and, and you're one of the ones that can really appreciate it. Like you say, um, it gives you perspective, just like being in the mountains and you look forward to that cheeseburger and that shower, living on the road and going to your storage unit to get your clothes that you're going to need for each season. Like it gives you perspective of, you know, someday I am going to have a home and now to have it and to be happy and to have somebody that, you, that you're sharing your life with and a place to ride your horses, a place to, to shoot your bow. Um, I, I bet you are enjoying it more than most. Oh, man. Well, let me tell you, I'm sitting here in the, my like mobile office chair that's now actually got a desk, and I can see wolves out of the corner of one of my eyes, and I got my sheep sitting in the other with a bunch of my trophies, and I got a long list of taxidermy, and I'm like, dang it, now I can actually put stuff up. So, Lord help me, I'm going to have to get another job just in order to board all the taxidermy I've been squirreling away. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah, I do the same thing. I trade my taxidermy work, and so um, he always Ooh. needs carpentry at different places or different times. You know, whether it's concrete or I repaint his house, and so I just yeah. work off a trade like the olden days with him, and it, it it's great. Like uh, my stuff doesn't get done the soonest. Yeah, I'm kind of the back burner guy, but I'm fine with that. So um, yeah, we kind of trade out work like the olden days. It works pretty good. You know what? I love a good old fashioned horse trade. <laughs> right uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah good barter for sure um 
But yeah, it's um well it's so nice to talk to you. I know we got woo woo on the podcast, but I feel the same way you do. It's so important. I think happiness is is the most important thing at life and we get one chance at this thing. You you better be trying to do what you love to do as much as you can. So, uh I think it's um very insightful and and uh I think guys can learn from it as well because life just isn't easy for any of us, you know, and you may look at somebody on social media, you know, we've talked a little bit about it. And everybody posts the highlights of their life or mm-hmm. everybody posts the good things. And it's almost, you know, and I'm not going to say all of us, but, you know, I'm guilty of it as well. And you almost create this mm-hmm. per- persona. And so you look on social media. I don't know if that's always a good thing. You know, you look at these people and you start comparing yourself or comparing your life or, or feeling like they have it better than you do. But but really life's about enjoying what you have and the opportunities you have. And, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be wealthy. I'm never going to be able to, you know, I, I say never, but I'm probably not going to be able to travel to, to some of these, these places that take a, a, a bunch of, of money, you know, like I'm like, I, I get to do these do it yourself adventures, the, the self planning, you know, a lot of them are lower 48. I also get to go to Alaska and Hawaii, but I, I have it so good. Um, just even doing those like you got to appreciate what you have in life and and being a, a blue collar bow hunter and being able to spend all these days in the wilderness yeah, i'm the i'm the luckiest guy alive like and i have to i have to see that and appreciate that and um i, I just think it's important that we get that time to reflect on our lives figure out what's really important and, and then make moves towards being happy so i really enjoyed the conversation rachel and i really Thanks. appreciate you for being so uh honest and and authentic and and sharing it with us because i i do think guys learn from it no oh, thank you i mean you know what and like you said i think it's literally it's it's learning to celebrate things that not are not always aren't highlights or that was really good english <laughs> it's learning to celebrate you know that we always we've got ups and downs in life and seasons and as long as we're doing things because we truly resonate and we are passionate about whether it's hunting or packing into the backcountry or just getting out there, I think that's, that's what it's all about. And at the end of the day, no post, no, no nothing is going to compare to the experience of actually being out there. And so I think if we remember that in our day-to-day life and figure out what's important to us, you can't lose. There's no losing as long as you're happy at the end of the day. And you work through your problems and, and you work through your, your greatest highs as well. You know, that's, to me, that's, that's a secret. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> that is the secret to life. I love it. Well, um, yeah, thanks again for sharing. Uh, uh, good luck to you on the bison hunt this year and, and getting some good meat. And it sounds like you're going to be trapping this next winter. And um, sounds sounds like you, you've you got things figured out, Rachel. And I'm really happy for you and, and uh, happy the, the way things are going for you. Hey, thank you very much, Brian. It's always a pleasure. Okay, and so make sure you check her out. Uh, she does have social media and makes great posts. Your photography is amazing. And then, um, you know, also make sure to check out that podcast that uh, you're going to be doing this fall. And, and uh, you, you started it um, last year, and then you're going to be continuing it this year um, now that you have Wi-Fi signal and a place to do it. So um, I'm excited for you to, to keep going with that journey as well. And, um, yeah, keep happy. Thanks again, Rachel. Thank you, man. Take care. Okay. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Um, yeah, just a real great, authentic conversation. I just, um, you know, you, you can make all the plans in the world, but it's really nice to get on a podcast and, and just talk back and forth and let the conversation go wherever it leads. And, and uh, Rachel is just, uh, she's just a, a, a really tough girl and she's a, a great guide. And I just can't imagine the extra obstacles that you got to challenge when you're a, a female guide. But um, she does it and guide and guiding guys on their dream hunts um for sheep and for caribou and then her own sheep story was just amazing sharing that with her dad and and her friends and um you know and, and then harvesting a really nice ram is so cool um but yeah just a a, a really um great conversation and I, i'm really glad i've gotten to meet and to know rachel she's just really authentic and i i like that um so uh yeah thanks to her for being on the podcast and um, sponsor for today's show is Sig Sauer. So Sig Sauer, um, you may know them from their their high quality pistols, but they're also making optics. I love that rangefinder, you guys. That's a uh, 
I think that's the best rangefinder I've ever used. Well, I know it is. It's um, gosh, it's just so accurate. It does angles. Um, I love what it offers for the rifle hunter. Uh, it's small. It's it's uh, great glass in it. And then their binoculars, I'm extremely impressed with. Um, they they're just so crisp and clear. Um, they stand up to, to all the most expensive glass out there, uh, but they're reasonably p- priced and, and super high quality. I also really like their spotting scope. I have their um, 15 to 45 power uh, by 65 millimeter objective lens, um, a good weight, uh, built to be durable, and, and then again, just extremely good glass in it. So I'm really impressed at what SIG's putting out there. Can't wait to use it this season. And uh, with that, yeah, make sure to check out that promo deal at Eastman's, 20 bucks for both magazines. Um, all just getting ready for our hunts. I'm not sure the next time we'll get together here, but, um, you know, we're, we're all keeping in touch um, all the time. They're lining up great podcasts, um, some great guests coming up, and just great authentic hunting conversations. And I'm just ready to get this season rolling, and, and uh, I really want to... Uh, be be diligent about getting good recordings while I'm on the hunt. I just love that information when it's fresh, when you have the these revelations when you're hunting and you solve the po- puzzle and you're successful or you, you, you just you look at things from a different angle. And it, it, I'm really going to take good notes this year is, is all those things really are fleeting as more time goes on. So um, I just want to be hitting off all cylinders and and hunting effectively, and then I want to share it with you guys to to help you guys get better and, and become more successful in the hills. And um, so coming up, we got some great podcasts. And uh, with that, I better get my stuff ready to go. I'm getting out of here, uh, getting to Alaska and then Nevada, a little time in between, but uh, I want to make sure I've got podcasts loaded up and, and ready for you guys. And these are some great conversations. want to thank Rachel again for being on and um, keep working hard towards your goals, you guys. Uh, if it isn't season yet, it's coming quick. And, uh, you know, be the best shot you can be, as in good a shape as you can be. And, and then um, go hard and fire off all cylinders on the hunt. So thanks, guys, for all the support. Uh, check in with you next week.